Hmm. How's everybody going? As they say in Australia, how are you, how are you going? How are you doing today? It is uh, Thursday. It's the Financial Thing live stream. Hopefully you can hear me well. Let me know if the uh, audio is sounds good. If you can hear me, I have a new uh, setup today. New webcam, a little nifty new background. Started at a new time. Uh, I don't know if we're going to always be doing it at 7.15. I don't know how convenient it is for people at 7.15, but I figured we'd try a new time this week and see if that works better. But uh, it's always a tricky time to you know, figure out which is the best time for everybody to be on here, but can't please everybody all the time, so... We're doing 7.15 this week. Thank you for letting me know about the audio and the video. So, as always, this is the weekly peer-to-peer -peer lending financial thing live stream. Um, I have a new web camera this week, so I'm hoping things will be a little bit more clean, a little bit sharper. And uh, got some nifty little LED lights. You can see the crystal ball back there, which is what we look to to find the future of peer-to-peer -peer lending. Yeah, I, I like the ambiance. It's, uh, it, was, it was challenging to find sort of the right ambiance look because, you know, lighting isn't easy, but I wanted to create a nice, calm, peaceful place where we could discuss investing and, you know, peer-to-peer -peer lending. Things, things are pretty stressful at the moment for us. So uh, more like a spa-like atmosphere here on the stream. So and I even put a shirt on. Thank you. Thanks, Keith, for that. I appreciate it. So as always, welcome to everybody. Please hit that thumbs up on the like button as it helps me with the YouTube algorithm and the search. And hopefully you get a lot of value out of this stream that we do every Thursday evening. May do one on Saturday. I'm not sure yet. Just depends. But uh, hi, Keith, and very balmy Lincoln. Yeah, I heard the weather is absolutely just very warm. So here in the U.S., I think we're expecting some kind of Sahara des desert sandstorm, which is going to be very interesting. But hi, Steve Manton, very hot, very hot Solly Hall. That, that name is, seems very familiar. What, Solly Hall, Birmingham, maybe? Um, Stephen Green. Hi, Stephen. Nice to see you, Alan, and, and Basingstoke, as always. Yeah, Stephen, you probably got here a couple of minutes early. I started the stream at 7.15, so hence you wouldn't have been able to see or hear anything. So Alan's here. Sue in North Staffordshire. It's 31 degrees in her kitchen. If anybody has any cooling techniques, let Sue know. Maybe some um, put a block of ice on your kitchen countertop. Hi, Steve Thomas and Colin from the Peak District. Um, Mike Southampton, Swanerhampton, maybe Mike. Mike, Mike Powell, as always, is here. Prominent member of the uh, Action Group, over there, which I'll post the link to. Hi, Mr. Smith. Peter and Leatherhead. Brian from Woborn. And oh, as always, Aki Chappie. Chappie is here from Accrington. Um, I, I'm going to make it a, uh, a bucket list thing to go and uh, visit Accrington one day. I have to know what is in Accrington. It just seems uh, interesting in Accrington. Hi, Mark Mason. How are you today? Sorry, this evening. Forget the time zone differences. And Arthur in sunny Belfast in Ireland. Nice to see Arthur. So uh, as always, we have a, a few things to get to. It's kind of been a, a bit of a weird week. Not too much news coming out. Um, we've got some Lendy, obviously some new things going on in the Lendy debacle and, oh, what else do we have? Some Zopa news. We have some, I usually write a little topic, um, a list of topics. Oh, here we go. Collateral update, which there really wasn't much of 
little bit of Grove Street news from Ratesetter. We're going to talk about uh, robo investing and kind of my results of my little robo investing test that I've been running for about two and a half years. And, you know, if you have any questions, of course, just pop them in the stream. And you know, if you want to talk about anything investment related, peer to peer lending, stock market, I've uh, been getting some emails about people who are doing betting, like guaranteed betting investments this week, which is interesting, but I don't, don't honestly know too much about that. So what else? A little bit of crowd property news. So yeah, you know, a little, some information on those, those things that we'll cover this week. Hi, Tony in Somerset, Craig from Scorching Ayrshire. And uh, Martin is always in Leeds, looking forward to hailstones through the night. What is, yes, doesn't it feel like the biblical plague is hitting right now that everything is just, is, is what a very strange 2020 so far. Had this strange COVID situation and, you know, uh, now this strange weather situation and it, it just feels like, you know, what, what else could possibly go wrong or maybe go right? What if we had the return of... Uh, of a biblical figure this year, that would be sort of top it all off, right? Top off 2020 is maybe the strangest year uh, in a long time. So let's get to this week's news. Um, if you've been following Zopa, you'll probably have heard that they have finally scored their full banking license after four years of trying, or maybe not trying, but putting in their applications. And uh, they had to get a large amount of capital requirement in order to be regulated. Uh, 140 million pounds they needed to have in capital to get their full banking license, which they managed to achieve. And, you know, I think it's interesting. Zopra, I'm kind of looking at Zopra thinking, where do you go with this whole banking license situation? Because you've got, you've got quite a you got quite a hurdle to overcome with investor trust, right? Yeah. Now, of course, a lot of people have, have used Oprah as a peer to peer lender, but are they going to want to tie up their funds? And what, from what I'm seeing with Zopa, they're not going to have anything shorter than a one year. Um, I, I don't know if you would call it a bond, but a one year commitment on your savings looks like one to five years and uh, possibly a credit card option that they'll be offering. Um, I'm going to give my thoughts about kind of what I think about credit card companies and not a big fan. I think they're pretty much, you know, corporate criminals that they offer these disgustingly high interest rates to people and they tend to get a lot of people in trouble. So I don't know what Zopa's credit card offering is going to be like, but as far as their fixed rates, I mean, you know, right now, I think the highest that I've seen is a 1.7% interest rate on a seven-year bond. Um, you know, if you're a uh, Marcus customer, you'll notice that they've shut their doors to new to new um, banking customers, so you can't get a Marcus savings account right now. Marcus was offering some really good, tasty interest rates. Um I just had a note. Somebody said I had to fix my shirt. So there we go. Yeah. So I, I, I'm wondering, you know, who is going to take these fixed, these fixed uh, rates for a fixed amount of time on a, on Zopra and what kind of rates can they really offer? I mean, I, I just can't say anything more than a 1% rate on a one year fixed interest term. And I certainly wouldn't want to be locking in my uh, funds for 1% for a year. I just, even though I don't think interest rates are going to go anywhere for the next year. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to lock up my money and in, in, into a, a bank, whether it be Zopa or Barclays or anyone for such a low interest rate. So I'm wondering who, who is Zopa's target audience when it comes to banking and how much money are they going to have to spend on advertising to really get people to give them their trust and their money? It's going to be very interesting. Will their credit card be what what makes them all the money? You know, if they're doing twenty two percent interest rates on credit cards, then maybe Zopa will 
um, actually make more off that than it's banking. Um, I don't know. It's, it's going to be interesting. I, I certainly won't be putting any money into Zopa's bank at this point. I'd rather, you know, take my chances in, in peer to peer and in, in the stock market, um, than I would in Zopa. So, but you know, congratulations to them for getting the banking license. It's not a very easy thing to do and they've been able to do it. So my hat goes off to them for that. Um, let's go ahead and talk about the debacle that is uh, Lendy. By the way, just a couple of announcements. Quick disclaimer. My friend said I have to say this every video. So this information is not financial advice and has not been pre prepared for you specifically without taking your objectives, financial situations, or needs into account. You should consider its appropriateness for your circumstances because all investment carries risk. Opinions expressed in this live stream are just that, opinions based on my own personal experiences. And remember that the wonderful FSCS protection does not cover any of your peer-to-peer -peer lending investments and your capital is at risk. So please don't invest more than you can afford to lose. So that's my new disclaimer. I figure I have to cover my, my arse. A um, couple of announcements. Please go ahead and join the Funding Secure Action Group. Here you go. Boom. And go ahead and join the Lendy Action Group. And we have Mr. Powell and Mr. Mason in here who do amazing work on behalf of investors, keeping them up to date on the information uh, for both Funding Secure and Lendy. Thank you to both of you for all the work that you do. Highly appreciated, especially for people that don't have enough time to keep up on that. Uh, also join the financial thing Facebook group right here. If you're not already joined into that, come join us. We have plenty of fun discussions about peer to peer lending and, and other forms of investing. Uh, please like the video today and subscribe to the YouTube channel. That's all of the announcements. So let's talk about Landy. Um, look, I'm definitely not an expert when it comes to what's going on in the Lendy administration process, and I do read the updates that come out, but it seems to me like this Lendy debacle is, just seems to get worse and worse and worse every week. Um, if you've seen the news that Liam Brooke, who was one of the founders and owners of Lendy, has uh, gotten his assets frozen, which uh, I'm quite frankly, look, I don't like to... Uh, bathe in the happiness of when somebody is going through unfortunate circumstances. But in the case of Mr. Lan, I'm not sure that I'm too upset that his assets have got him frozen. If what has been alleged by the administrator um, report that came out very recently, if you haven't seen that, uh, if you're a Lendy investor, you should have gotten an email how to access that report. But uh, to quote the report, the investigations have been concerned with a number of transactions, most significantly payments of approximately 6.8 million pounds that were paid to entities registered in the Marshall Islands for apparent marketing services carried out for Lendy. However, the administrators have alleged that these payments were ultimately for the benefit of Mr. Brooke and Mr. Tim Gordon. Let me say that again, 6.8 million pounds allegedly siphoned off to the Marshall Islands. I have no idea where that is, never heard of it. Uh, and used for marketing services in the Marshall Islands because I'm sure the Marshall Islands has a ton of wonderful marketing companies out there that could definitely assist Lindy in their uh, marketing endeavors. So what the administrators is basically saying that Mr. Liam Brooke and Mr. Gordon, two principal owners of Lendy, have uh, siphoned off 6.8 million quid, probably for their own benefit. Oh, thanks, Mike. Yes, uh, Mike Powell says it's in the Pacific. Uh, sounds like a lovely place to go. I wouldn't mind just going to the Marshall Islands and see if we could find this uh, marketing company that exists there 
and uh because yeah maybe they'd be a good marketing company to hire for to, for financial thing but so yeah um allegedly again this is all what's being reported that the funds have been siphoned off to the Marshall Islands for marketing services uh but probably not that probably have gone into the pockets of uh, Mr. Brooke and Mr. Gordon and uh, they probably saw the writing on the wall you know either they were just complete crooks and siphoning money off all along or maybe they saw the writing on the wall with regards to the crap uh, loans that they decided to put out on Landy's platform and they just decided to siphon off some cash because when, when, when everything uh, would go tits up for them they would have a nice little nest egg to fall back on on top of that they can receive the nice little waterfall payments that are coming in from the loans so anyway, back to the report. It said on June first, two thousand June first, two thousand and twenty, the joint administration made an application to court for a worldwide freezing injunction to be granted over the assets of Mr. Brooke and Mr. Gordon, as well as propriety injunctions on the properties owned by companies linked to the directors, which are RFP Holdings Limited and LP Alhambra Limited. And thankfully, due to the wonderful court system they did uh, have that order granted so everything that mr brook and mr gordon owns uh has been frozen now who knows how much was given to the wives and families of of those two but time will tell uh and yeah it's it's a pretty shitty shitty piece of news that's come out um, is it surprising? Probably not. I mean, I'm kind of an optimist when it comes to people. I always think that people have good intentions most of the time. And, uh, unfortunately in this case, it seems like, uh, they probably didn't have good intentions. And unfortunately investors are going to suffer because of that. Now, you know, in a good case scenario, some of those properties are able to be liquidated and that money can be returned to lend these investors we'll see i mean 6.8 million is not a huge amount when you consider how much money is still owed to investors which is you know 100 and 100 100 plus million I, I forget what the exact number is maybe mike can tell us that number but i think maybe 150 million still owed something like that so 6.8 it's really just not going to put much of a damper in in what investors wrote. Um, so a couple of other things that was in uh, a Times report the same representatives of Lendy investors said that the role of Moore Stevens, part of BDO, which is the administrator in the Lendy situation, uh, which is so Moore Stevens is an international accountancy firm, and Lendy investors representatives are saying that. Moore Stevens should be examined after fresh allegations about alleged financial irregularities that have been emerging more good news and then we get this news story about high houseboat tycoon mick dergberger i don't no idea how to pronounce his name but he's being accused of three million pounds three and a half million pounds in fraud allegedly living in one of the properties secured on by a lendy loan uh Mr. Mick decided to sell houseboats to people that apparently didn't have rights to more in places. And so he is, is tied to Lendy with the loans. Uh, you can read that news story if you want on, on Yahoo. Right there. Hopefully that works. Come on, come on, send. Oh, it's a little bit too. For some reason I can't. If you Google it, I'll put in his name. I can't put it in the chat because there's too many characters on the on the link. But if you Google this guy, Mick Drugberger, Google his name, you'll be able to read that news story. Also in that Lendy administration update, says the administrators are unable to provide any material updates on any loans until such a time as a property sale or refinance have concluded is they don't want to prejudice the outcome of an individual loan. Uh, so there won't be any more platform updates. That, uh, they usually do monthly, so there's not going to be any of those. And only 
individual loan updates once a sale or refinance is concluded. And also from the administrator's report on Lendy, in the period covered since appointment, the joint administrators have incurred significant time costs in managing the wind down of the loan book as previously advised. The loan book has proved to be in a considerably worse state than was immediately apparent on our appointment. As a result, the process to realize secured assets has been complex, difficult, and time-consuming than was first envisaged. It has become apparent there were significant issues in Lendy's underwriting and administration processes, which has contributed significantly to the complexity of the wind down and directly led to an increase in costs. As an example, on multiple cases, there is a range of litigation directly linked to the historical Lendy practices. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so since the date of appointment, the joint administrators of Lendy and SSA, SSA, this is a hard one to say, Triple S H L, have incurred time costs totaling 2.7 million pounds. Okay. And the joint administrators have provided the creditors committee with a fee estimate for the second year of an administration, which will total 1.482 million pounds. So what that means to us as investors is the administrators are are charging a hefty amount of money. Um, and it's just going to be taken out of the investors' funds at the end of the day. So um, this, this is an unfortunate part of an administration process that I certainly didn't think, first of all, that Lendy would hit the wall that they hit when I was investing through them in my early days. But I also didn't realize, you know, how costly administration would be and it really makes sense that the administration would be this costly because if you can imagine a loan book that's in default most of the loans are in default at this point uh, obviously the costs of dealing with a defaulted loan book are, are going to be high you know from my perspective what i didn't realize is that i thought you know if lendy went out of business the loans would be okay um you know, I thought the loans would be in, in good order and that the administrators would be able to take over the loans and then administrate, administer them as need be. But obviously when things go into litigation, into the court system, you're just going to incur a massive amount of expenses and costs. And, and you know, at this point we're talking about 2.7 mil plus another 1.4. So that's close to 4.2. And if I had to put a guess on how much this is really going to cost administration wise, I'm thinking six mil, maybe. So maybe that 6.8 mil that's uh, been siphoned off into the Marshall Islands will just go to pay the administration costs. So, um, yeah, it's not a great situation. Let me know what your thoughts are. What do you think about this Lendy situation? Um, yeah. Anyway, that's the Landy news of the week. It's not been great. So rate setter, let's talk about rate setter. So the Metro Bank deal um, is not looking really good. There was a report that Metro Bank is afraid of its reputation should rate setter's 800 million pound loan book run into trouble. And well, what Metro Bank really wants is rate setters technology and their expertise in lending. I don't think they're really interested in, in rate setters loan book. And, you know, I can't blame them because I was thinking about this deal last week and I'm thinking who would buy an unsecured loan book in the middle of a COVID pandemic? You'd have to be a pretty, uh, you'd have to really know something that we don't know about that loan book that would make you even want to look at a loan book like that because Unsecured investments are definitely the, one of the first things that are going to go. If a borrower is paying on a loan and they don't have anything really to lose other than a bad mark on their credit report and they can't pay their bills, they're going to let that loan go. Um, 
Yeah, so I can't blame Metro Bank at all. If I was Metro Bank, I probably wouldn't want to buy rate setters loan book either. You know, why? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, I would imagine if they make some lowball offer to rate setter, no, I wouldn't be surprised. I think somewhere in the region of 30 to 50 million pounds will probably be what Metro tries to take rate setter over for. Um, what happens to the loan book is a good, good question. Nobody really knows at this point. Uh, but the other side of it, Metro is, has not really been known for making very smart decisions anyway. So maybe if they do decide to buy rate setter, it wouldn't be such a huge surprise. They don't have a great track record. On the secondary market side, for everybody that's trying to exit out of rate setter, they are releasing about half a million pounds a day. So there is still some liquidity there. Um, I totaled it up since the 4th of May. It's rate set has been delivering about 3.6 million pounds a week. Sorry, a month. Is it a week or a month? No, a week. About 3.6 million pounds a week since the 4th of May, 2020. So funds are coming out. It's just kind of going slow. Uh, I still seem to be stuck in the queue. I tried to exit March the 3rd. 13th was when I put in my access exit request and it's still stuck. I think from what I understand, March 12th of the processing date. So I just seem to miss it by one day. Uh, looks like a five year exit is going to be a pretty long time. Um, currently queued at number 408,733 is my request number. And from what I understand, they're roughly running about 387,000 in the reference numbers this week. So I think it's going to be a good long time uh, before any money gets released in the five-year market. But if you want to track how other investors are doing on their releases, you can go ahead and put it on the peer-to-peer -peer independent forum. They have a good graph table that shows you where everybody is. So good news, Paul. Let's give you a bit of good news. My uh, beloved loan pad seems to be doing fine at the moment. Their average loan to value is still stuck at a beautiful 26%. Uh, 24 loans, one in default, it's only 150K. One extended loan, two loans overdue, and average loan size of 368,000 uh, pounds. So I, I think if there's a bright spark in peer to peer lending at the moment, it, it could well be loan pad. Yeah, as well as crowd property, I think are doing well too, and some other ones. But I think there is some good news. You know, I'm, I'm at Paul. I try to deliver you the latest news, and unfortunately, the latest news seems to be the bad news. And I don't think you're going to hear much good news in, in peer to peer lending as far as it being broadcast because the news companies wouldn't get a lot of readers if they put, oh, Loan Pad's doing great. They're paying 3.5% interest annually. You know, they want to focus on the bad news. So and obviously we do have a lot of people that have money in Lendy that had invested in those companies that have gone bad. But yeah, I think LoanPad is a bright a bright spark in the peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending world. Um, just from a personal side, I got a, a collateral liquidation email this week. There wasn't, we haven't had a report as far as I can see on collateral yet, but there is supposed to be one coming. Uh, what they say I had invested versus what I say I had invested, there's about a 3% discrepancy there. But um, So I don't understand why there's a discrepancy, but apparently they think that, uh, that I have 3% less invested than I did. Funding circle of share price, price is 75p this week. Don't invest in funding circle shares, please. Uh, yeah. Crowd property has been going really good. I started my investing in crowd property on June 4th. Obviously still early days, but so far I've been invested using strictly the auto invest, uh, nine loans in already. And I've been allocated about half of what I've requested. Now I did get up a very early crack of dawn one morning to look at the manual lending and it filled very quickly. Actually the loan that I got up to look at, I really didn't want. 
any p- piece of it. It was a um, like a school building that was being renovated and it was kind of in a more rural area. It's not too far outside of a city, but I tend to stay away from places that are quieter areas. I just think that those type of properties, if something happens to them, are generally harder to sell. But I did want to see how quickly the loan filled it, and it filled in less than a minute. Uh, the first amount batch of auto invest was put in, and that filled up 60% of the allocation in the first few seconds. And then after that, people who were manually investing were allocated. So I think it would be possible to snag some of the manual portions in Crown Property if you were willing to be on your computer a few minutes before 10 a.m. and do it that way. So personally, I, I'm okay with just doing the auto investment. So I've been pretty happy with Crown Property. And they've, they've offered obviously quite a lot of loans this, this uh, month so far, nine loans. So they have a really good deal for low. Um, yeah, so that, that basically is the peer to peer lending news. Let me go ahead and look at your comments. I have a couple of other things too. Um, go once again, go ahead and just hit that thumbs up if you can helps me out immensely. Uh, Aki says Santander at 1% and dropped to 0.6% in August. Yeah. You're just going to see those interest rates continue to drop. Uh, yeah, Marshall Islands is probably better than Accrington. Uh, you might, you might offend the, uh, Mr. Aki Chappie with, with chat like that. I X O N S. <laughs> Hi, Stephen in Nottingham. How's it going? Never trust a man who spells Nick with a Y. <laughs> Craig, uh, yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mr. Aki. Hit that thumbs up. Yeah, so Mike says 150 million pounds still owed to lending investors. Money is being pursued for creditors, not investors, and doesn't seem to cover offices sold by Lendy to the subsidiary. Yeah, I, I fear that, that this whole administration is way more complicated, difficult to understand uh, for us average folks. So um, unfortunately, I think you're just going to see continue to see these curveballs that are being thrown as the news starts to come out. But it, it's going to be a complicated administration process that is likely going to take, I would guess, another two or three years to uh, finish up. So we'll see. So Peter Vint says, Landy, like you, we are led to believe that if a peer-to-peer company goes bust, the loans will be looked after by a nominated company. So it'll all be hunky-dory. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think on my, you know, I was, I was very naive when I took that assumption because if you really think about how it works, it would be very hard for an administrator just to walk in and say, oh, we're going to take over this loan book. And, you know, unfortunately, Lendy doesn't even have COVID to blame for their problems. That's the sad thing. You know, I look at some of the other peer-to-peers that may be under a, a cash crunch right now. So maybe, you know, rate sets are, and, and they've really been a victim of COVID. And we don't know what's going to happen with rate setter. I think rate setter will, will be okay. But uh, Lendy and Funding Secure, they weren't even victims of, of COVID because this stuff and these failures happened even before COVID happened. But I think I was very naive when I looked at how the administration process would work. And to be honest, I just didn't think that these companies were going to go under. I had very, very optimistic views of the peer-to-peer companies because I like the I like the sector. I think it's it's very innovated, but you know, na- naivety and mistakes happen, and I was prone to it too. Peter Vince says, "I'm loving Unbolted." Yep, Peter uh, Unbolted is seems to be doing okay. Just again, please remember to diversify. Just because one company is doing good now doesn't mean that they'll continue to do so. Uh, that's why it's good to spread funds around different bits of peer lending companies and loans. Mike says, everyone will be leaving the cities post-COVID. I don't know, Mike. So you think that, but people have very short memories, right? I mean, imagine if COVID starts to really drop off over the next six months and then it becomes 
a smaller problem than it was. People just, they tend to forget things very quickly. Uh, I remember people telling me in, in, during the financial crisis of 08 and 09, I'll never own real estate again. And I'll never get back into the stock market. And uh, uh, two years later, three years later, when the market starts to rebound, people are pouring monies back in equities and who said, I would never invest in the stock market again. And I think maybe the same with, with COVID people will, eventually migrate back to the cities that have left. So we'll see. Alan said, I managed to invest manually in crowd property, but there is a minimum of 500 pounds that caught me out the first time I tried. Yes, very important point. If you do want to manually invest in crowd property, you do have to put in a minimum of 500 quid on a loan. Steven said collateral missing cash might be invested, uninvested cash in the holding account. That's a good point. I didn't even think about that. Hi, Derek in North Devon. How are you today, this evening? Nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate every single one of you for being here, listening to me ramble on about nothing. Tony says, I noticed with LoanPad that they have multiple loans to the same borrower. If things go wrong, then my liability will be up to five times the individual individual allocation. Any comments? Yes. So, Tony, um, just clarify. So, Tony, LoanPad only has one lending partner, and that is H-A-N-D-P-F Capital who I have been to visit, by the way. I've been to both Lone Pad's offices a couple of times. I've been to Hanf Capital, their borrowing partner. Um, it is a very small family-owned lending company that has been lending for about 40 years. I think they have about 70 million pounds of money, so they lend out their own cash. Um, they usually have a minimum of 25% of skin in the game. Um, sometimes much higher and um, they have a great relationship with LoanPad. So Louie, who is the CEO of LoanPad, is, he's a, a lawyer by trade and a solicitor and he's been working on Hans uh, underwriting deals, doing the legals on their property loans for the last 13 years, I believe. So he has a very good understanding of Hanf. So Hanf has a network of people that they lend money to, and they're very selective about who they loan money to. So you will see some of the same borrowers on the loan documents. And that's done for a good reason, because rather than lending to different borrowers that they don't have a history and a track record with, Hanf far prefers to work with people that they've worked with in the past several times. They see that as being much safer. And I'd say I'd have to agree with them in some respects. You know, Hanf is, they've got their lending criteria very, very much down to a science. So you will see some duplications there. Uh, initially, I thought with LoanPad that it's got to be a huge negative, right? That they only have loans written through Hanf. But when I sat with Louis and he sort of explained to me and when he took me to meet the owner, of Hanth, and I really understood what that, how important that relationship is that they have, and why Louis believes that LoanPad is one of the lowest risk peer to peer lending investments out there because of that relationship and, and because of the large amounts of skin in the game that Hanth has in each loan. And remember, too, that LoanPad is a first charge. Uh, they have the first charge even before Hanth, who has all of that skin in the game. So that just puts uh, loan pad in a very good first position should anything happen to the loans. Obviously, nothing is guaranteed. And, you know, if things hit the fan, then loan pad would experience problems. But uh, you just have to look at all the criteria and the way that they have things set up. And once you really understand how things are set up, then it really does make a lot of sense. So that's my comments. Totally not worried about it, Tony. Yeah, so we had some Grove Street news. There's been a action group that's set up to help assist borrowers with refinancing. As far as Grove Street goes, not really too much news aside of that. Um, I was scratching my head as to why I was paid back 
and why some other people haven't. Uh, there isn't, isn't much of a, uh, there's not much of an explanation how the queue works with, with grocery and who knows whether they paid me back because I have a blog. I don't know. Who knows? But I've heard of some people haven't been paid back at all and other people have. So, yeah, it's a shame. Derek says, with Growth Street foreclosing on their good borrowers, could they go to other peer-to-peer -peer companies with CBILS accreditation? Yes. I think that you will see those companies trying to apply for CBILS loans. Um, again, I think the application success rate on those loans has been about 50%. So hopefully some of those Growth Street borrowers will be able to refinance and get out of there. Yeah, so you could get your money back. Hi, Kerno, Kerno Flow. Nice to see you tonight. Yes, good point, Mike. Landy like working with the same borrows too. However, Landy had a very much different system set up, and I didn't have the pleasure of going to meet any of Landy's borrowers or Landy other than the face-to-face -face podcast that I did that has a good amount of thumbs down, which I totally understand. Um, if you want to let, check out my channel, I had a uh, podcast interview live with Liam Brooke and another gentleman who was dealing with the marketing there. So you can go watch that and listen to the what Mr. Brooke, Mr. Liam Brooke had to say at the time. But yeah, I agree with you, Mike. There's obviously there's always risk, but uh, I do like the fact uh, that panth and 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 louis at lone pad have this really strong relationship and you know from from my own gut feeling they they do really care about investors and i just didn't get that feeling with uh with lendy so yeah gary says aren't your loans constantly being di re-diversified with loan pad which helps reduce risk yes gary they are Exactly right. They are reallocated when new new loans do get released to the platform. So that should cut down your risk. <laughs> Aki Chap. Uh, you know, I don't know where Chica Boy is tonight. His name is Billy, by the way. Um, he's a regular on the stream, but tonight, sadly, my heart is very sad. I, I do hope that he has not contracted COVID or some other fate has happened to him, but, um, Chica boy, you are missed. You might, you, yeah, you, this stream goes out to you tonight, Chica boy. I hope you're okay. Peter says, was my grocery repayment just fortuitous timing? All your investments happen to repay just after the cutoff dates. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that. I don't, I had the same, uh, reinvestment settings put you know my, my stuff was set to reinvest i couldn't change it so it just seems strange that it was in, the entire amount was returned all in one go because i figured it would be drip fed where i would receive a portion so yeah i don't know why why i was blessed with receiving a gross street repayment and other people want uh yeah so anything <laughs> So those I laugh at the <laughs> the comments. I'm here. David's here from sweaty Norfolk. <laughs> is it David? Is it you that's sweaty, or is it Norfolk that's sweaty? Did you miss anything, David? You got to come earlier. Let me know if this time works for you too. Does does seven fifteen? Is it better for you? Is seven thirty better for you? Do you like eight fifteen? No, I figured I'd do it a little bit early. Mike says uh, Chica Boy's probably <laughs> stuck in the massive traffic jam coming back from Bournemouth Beach. Is that true? Was there a traffic jam? That's my hometown too. I just, um, you know, I can't imagine going on the beach right now. I just think it's a terrible idea. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> Paul, thank you for telling us about your bath. I appreciate that. 8 p.m. So, yeah, we... I think it was, 
have an itchy nose. But yes, uh, Paul, how was your bath tonight? Was it good? So yeah, we got some thumbs up for seven fifteen. We got some thumbs up for eight. Maybe we'll do a half and half. Maybe you know eight uh, seven thirty. Maybe seven thirty five. Bournemouth is in disgrace tonight. You'd think I'd see the yeah, I don't I didn't know about Bournemouth. I've spent many and many hours. When I was a kid, I used to sweep Bournemouth Beach with a broom, sweep all the sand. If you go to Bournemouth and you see the promenades all nice and clean, there's a group of poor guys that are paid about three pounds an hour to sweep off the sweep off the uh, promenade. Yes, hi, greetings from Portugal. I'm glad you're here. And you like the light, light and sound. Yeah, I've got these uh, nifty little LEDs to bring ambiance to the stream. 10,000 people in a traffic jam coming back from Bournemouth. I mean, this is just terrible. I mean, I didn't even know. Bournemouth, Bournemouth. Please tell thousands of day trip Troopers packed into Bournemouth Beach in the 92 degree heat to go home. Bournemouth. Wow. I mean, these pictures are <laughs> absolutely insane. What? What are they thinking being so close together? Wow. Wow. I was just looking at the, uh, looking at the pictures. That's insane. So, uh, yes, you asked, have, have I tried Blend? Craig, no, I haven't. Uh, I've visited Blend's offices a couple of times. And, yeah, Jan, who runs Blend, I think is a very sharp individual. Obviously, some of the deals are paying higher percentages, so and they are doing a lot of deals in, in Ireland. Not saying that's a bad thing. Obviously, there is some risk involved there, but... I think, again, if I look at the person running it and the staff and the team who's working with Blend, I think that they're very knowledgeable and they have a great, you know, especially Jan, he he was a uh, trader, a city trader for a long time, so he understands risk very well and tries to find deals that uh, risk-reward balance is good. So, yeah. I don't think Blend Blend is actually on the list of companies that I probably will invest in. Uh, Crowd Property was first. Uh, I'm thinking Blend and also Invest in Fund looks looks really interesting at the moment. So Gary says I've been trying to invest with Blend for a month, but everything sells out quicker than Crowd Property recently. Yeah, you tend to see that people flock towards the deals that they think are considered to be a little bit safer. So yeah. Hacky, I I don't know if I'll do a maybe I'll do a one on one stream for, for Chica Boy. <laughs> Cheeky boy. <laughs> we can we can have a private stream. That would that'd be somewhat uncomfortable. So Andy says with loan with load pad, I presume you loan pad. Not all of your cash is invested. You have cash waiting to reinvest. You're still getting interest on that cash. No, you are not. There's a minimum of a 10 pound investment with loan pads. So anything that's under 10 pounds that's not being invested, you don't get any interest in. Tony says, Mr. Tony Walton, Cufflink keep announcing new investments almost daily. Are they doing that well against the trend? Um, they said to me when I spoke to them, they've had a lot of requests for loans and they see business as usual. So they are, I mean, as long as they keep their underwriting standards high, that's the big question. Yeah. Mike, this is, yeah, this is actually, <laughs> this is a jam jar. I don't know why I'm drinking out of a jam jar. Actually, I do know. I'll tell you why I'm drinking out of a jam jar. So I have a friend who came over to visit 
a few days ago who might have COVID and I put everything in the dishwasher to sanitize it. So yeah, this was the only thing I had clean. This is a jam jar. So there you go. I'm hoping I haven't contracted COVID. Time will tell. He's supposed to get his results back today. We'll see. I'm I'm talking quietly because I don't like to, you know, put COVID news out. Just in case. I don't know who's watching YouTube. Not that the speaking quietly really makes any difference because I'm still speaking. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of sneaky about the whole COVID thing. So if you don't see me next week, for some reason, you'll know that I've contracted COVID. Ken says, my cufflink loans terminal dates will keep getting extended. Concerned that some of these will go south. Um, look, you're in, a, you're in a very difficult financial place when it comes to loan and lending right now. I'd be surprised if people were paying their loans on time. I think it's going to be completely normal for real estate people and property developers to get extensions on their loans. So I don't know. Yeah, obviously, Ken, there's always a default risk when it comes to any of these peer-to-peer -peer lenders that they're doing development and bridging. Cufflink is no stranger to that. And they're also no exception to the fact that they will probably have some kind of defaults to deal with. Uh, again, diversify. Don't put too much money in any one peer-to-peer -peer company. Stephen Green, Blend is a Blend Network. It's a, they, they do property development bridging lending you can look them up online auto land works on blend you have to invest a thousand pounds yeah unfortunately that's one of the downsides for people that don't want to shove so much money into blend you they have a thousand pound per minimum loan um that's one of the reasons i haven't been so quick to jump in to them so yeah there's that Martin says, what do I use to protect my passwords? Yeah, I use LastPass. I'll write it in the chat for you, Martin. I've been using that company for probably know, eight years. So LastPass is what I use to do password protection. Uh, Gary says, I'm not a fan of leaving cash sat uninvested and no details on the site of pipeline, unlike crowd property where you get viability for upcoming loans. Yeah, Gary, if you're talking about loan pad, I, I've never seen anything more than 10 pounds sat in my holding account, so it just tends to get reinvested. But if you talk about another company, I think having a 1K sat there is not very good. Uh, ES uses LastPass. I love LastPass. I mean, who can remember all of the passwords nowadays anyways? LastPass used to be really good, and then something happened where it, I don't know if it was an update. Some of the browsers, but some of their autofill information doesn't always work. So kind of annoying but still better than uh, some of the other options out there. My David says, my assets capital withdrawal amounts have decreased over the last fortnight. Wondering if anyone else is finding this. Maybe I should do a vlog. <laughs> yeah. Oh, excuse me. One sec. I yeah. I, again, there's, there's going to be absolutely no consistency in peer to peer lending, or I would say investing in general over the next three to six months. So you're going to see, Withdrawals, da, 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 go like that. Don't be surprised. So let's talk about um, Grove Street. What, how optimistic should investors be? What's my view on Grove Street? Well, it depends whether they can get their businesses refinanced or not. Um, I would say if they've done their lending due diligence and they've given businesses who are somewhat 
sturdy loans, grocery will be okay. If they've lent to businesses that are struggling because of COVID and who can't get refinanced, obviously if the businesses can't refinance, grocery doesn't get paid back. Investors will be waiting some time to get paid. Uh, I would say I would have been more optimistic when I knew Greg Carter was in charge. I don't know the person that's in charge right now. Um, I, I really thought Greg was doing a great job at Grove Street, so I'm less optimistic about it because of Greg not being there, but I don't really know. I think it's too early to tell. Uh, I don't think you're going to know for the next three months. It takes time to get uh, refinanced in the lending world, so once we find out who's going to refinance and who's not, you're going to have a better indication of how Grove Street is. Thanks for clarifying, Gary. So last thing I want to chat about is I've been getting a few emails this week about robo-investing companies. So for the last, I started a little test account with a robo-investment company, Wealth Simple. And what Wealth Simple does is basically they take the decision-making out of the investing. You send them money, they invest it for you. Uh, they use passive investing, which I, you know I'm a big fan of. That's basically index trackers, and you don't have to decide to do anything. You send them the money and they invest it. You could decide how risky you want your portfolio to be. So what I did is I started an account October 2017, and I took an 80%, 20% risk, which means 80% went into equities and 20% into bonds. Um, that that is on the higher risk scale of investing and what my results were. So, oh, by the way, so Robert, uh, Wealth Simple takes 0.7% in fees a year. It's not terrible. I mean, yeah. You know, that, that doesn't include the fund fees. So, uh, just to give you an idea of my portfolio, so I have 26.5% in, in a UK tracker, iShares. I have 16% uh, in a US Vanguard tracker, another 16% in a different type of US tracker, and then 9.2% in company bonds, which would be considered corporate bonds, 8.2% in emerging markets, shares, 5% UK government bonds, 9.6% uh, in Europe, excluding the UK equities. One has a fund fee of 0.8%, the other 0.25%. About 3.5% in Japanese equities, 2% uh, in other Asian equities, excluding Japan, 1.7% in global high, high yield bonds, and then 1.6% in emerging market bonds. So you can see I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 12 funds, so 12 index trackers in a bucket and well simple. So what has it done? Um, since October two, seven, two, 2017, so we're talking about just a little over two and a half years, the robo of investing has returned 5.7% total. It's not good. Um, and the projected return for my portfolio annually is 4.7%. That's over the next 23 years. So if I had a thousand pounds right now in wealth simple, and I invested a hundred pounds a month of 4.7%, I would end up with a total of about 53,000 pounds. If I took that same investment strategy and invested in a US equity tracker fund, say strictly the Vanguard fund, I would probably see returns in the range, I think of seven to 8%. So that, that uh, investment difference is gonna be 20,000 pounds. So while simple would return me about 53,000, 
which is the robo investor and my own strategy would return me about 73,000. So that robo investor is costing me about 20 grand on a thousand pounds to begin and a hundred pounds a month. So what is the problem with, with this wealth simple? The problem is this, uh, being at 26 and a half percent invested in UK equities is something I wouldn't do. Um, that's a FTSE tracker. FTSE 100 tracker is just too small and it's overweight. So I'm about half and half US, UK when it comes to equities. If you look at the performance of the UK tracker, which I've got 26% allocation into, it's at negative 5.6% return total. So 26% of my portfolio has had a negative 5.6% return. This is the problem with UK equities, and this is the problem with robo investing, uh, especially through well, simple as you cannot choose. At least I haven't figured out a way because if you make a change to your portfolio, you have to do it by emailing them. There's no way to automatically do that. Um, I would want to be very heavily weighted into U.S. equities because I believe that U.S. businesses will will thrive in the long term. And the U.S. equity market is much bigger. You know, the index trackers are much bigger than the U.K. They're, there's only a hundred companies in the U.K. trackers. So if I'm I'm at a negative five point one per six, negative five point six percent performance on my robo investor, the only thing that saved my portfolio is the U.S. equity investment side, uh, which is returned thirty. So one of the one of the the Vanguard fund is twenty six and a half percent up, and the other U.S. equity fund is twelve and a twelve point four percent up total over the two years, two and a half years. We look at the emerging markets. So the company bonds just returned eleven point five percent, but I only have nine percent in that. Emerging market equity tracker has only returned a half percent total. I, I have eight eight percent in that. The UK government bonds has been good, seventeen percent return. But again, I only have five percent in that. And the European equities have struggled. About one is five point seven percent up. One is three and a half percent up. Um. Yeah, it's it's not great. So you know, people who have been emailing me saying. Robo investing, should I do it? My answer to you is I think you're going to lose about anywhere from three, I think about three to three and a half percent losses in your returns um, versus what you could get just choosing one or two index trackers. Maybe even if you went with a, you know, if you're not comfortable with the US, go with the global, which has about 60% US in it. You could do that. Uh, personally, I'm very bullish on the U.S. equity trackers. I just think that they're going to do better over the long period. So the robo robo advisor has not been really great. I think what actually Wealth Simple has done is they've taken a very simple concept of of using passive investing and then overcomplicated it because they've just bought a bucket of funds, right? To say, well, you're really well diversified, you know, because you have Europe and you have UK government. You've got global high, high yield bonds, and it just it overcomplicates, right? Something that could be really simple by you picking out a tracker that's historically done well yourself. You don't need to pay somebody zero point seven percent a year to shove you into twelve passive index trackers. I mean, they're essentially doing what financial advisors have been doing to people for years, which is to take your money and uh, give it to a company that invests in 10 or 15 managed unit trusts and then returns you 5%. You know, I have a, uh, I have a meeting with a financial advisor tomorrow on the phone, which my family has been using for 25, maybe 30 years. And they just have this very old school way of, of, handling investments, which is 40% in the UK, 20% in the US, because they're so, for some reason, these 
uh, English financial advisors, they just so they they love to put your money into UK funds. That's not always the best place to put them. So I have a meeting with him tomorrow on the phone. I, I don't think it's going to be a particularly pleasant one because I've been battling with this advisor for the last four years about trying to get them to reallocate away from UK uh, into the US. And they, you know, they've been giving me this argument about, well, managed funds are so much better than passive. Um, you know, man fund managers know what they're doing, right? We don't know what we're doing when it comes to passive investing. And their argument is very flawed. And I'm, I, you know, I'm not a licensed financial advisor, so they automatically assume probably that I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, but the numbers don't lie. And on the graph that they sent me about the performance of their managed uh, account versus passive, they're, they're always at the bottom. <laughs> I looked at the graph yesterday. I was uh, showing my brother-in-law or, or my cousin. Like the, their, their line is always at the bottom and it's, uh, and yet they they want to stay in this stuck in this old school mentality of invest in the FTSE, invest in the FTSE. Maybe the FTSE will be great one day. I don't know. Historically, it's just never really you know kept up with the U.S. So the fact is, a lot of the biggest U.S. Uh, biggest companies in the world are in the U.S. and they are the ones that are doing the best financially and you know over the periods of time. So. So wealth simple, do I give it a thumbs up? No, I, I think you can do it yourself. You don't need wealth simple. You can just invest in an index tracker yourself and save yourself 0.7%. And probably a lower return rate over a period of time. That's my opinion anyway. If you're watching wealth simple, sorry. I know you're out there for the average Joe. Yeah. Or, or Bob or whoever who just doesn't know what they're doing. And for us, we tend to be a little bit more astute. Again, if you haven't read the book, The Little Book of Common Sense Investing, please do yourself a favor. John Bogle wrote that book. It's a very, very great book, just full of wonderful information. Um, you know, learn, learn about your investments in the stock market and your unit trusts and mutual funds. Yeah, you know, learn about them and how they work and why why they're a good idea. That would be my advice. I know David's read that book. Tony, uh, well, let me go through your questions. I've been sort of having a bit of a rant there about Wealth Simple. So I don't know what I'm going to do with this Wealth Simple account. I'll probably just keep it. You know, I'd like to see over a period of maybe five years how it does compared to the tracker funds. Uh, I have to tell you something too, if I'm being completely honest. Uh, I, I really want to make good content for the, for the uh, financial thing challenge channel. So what I want to do, and this is probably a terrible idea from an investment standpoint, but I signed up for this stock advising subscription service that a lot of people have told me is very good. So I think what I'm going to do is invest some cash into these stock picks and just document over a period of maybe the next couple of years to see how these, uh, actually probably a minimum of three years to see how the stock picks do versus a passive index tracker. Um, not normally what I would do, but I've, I've just become more interested in sort of reading about individual stocks. I still think index tracking is the way to go because I can tell you from a personal, like, you know, emotional experience when I look at my phone every day and I look at the individual stocks that I have, um, set as favorites because this is what the stock picking company advised to do. And when I see the, the stocks going like up like that. I get excited. I feel this rush of good energy. When I see the prices declining, I start to feel this like depression of, oh, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I shouldn't invest in these stocks. And I think that's the emotional swings and roundabouts that come with buying individual stocks and shares, especially if you see a stock doing poorly for an extended period of time. Right now we're in like the gold rush of the stock market. I don't know if you've looked at some individual stocks at the moment, but 
some of them are, I've seen them going up seven or eight, nine percent a day and then falling back like amazing volatility. So I think an index tracker just helps you to stay more leave hands off, you know, don't try to buy and sell sell individual stocks. But I think I'm gonna test it. Um, you know, hopefully it'll be a more for the channel and for video content than for my own uh hopefully it's not unlocking a bit of gambling that I have inside of me. Cause I, I do get a little bit afraid that I start delving into the world of buying individual stocks and shares. It could become very addictive and you know, that's not my goal. So <laughs> yeah. And David says, there's no way I'd give 0.7% a year to a robot. Do it yourself, I reckon. Absolutely. Totally agree. FTSE 1, FTSE 199. FTSE 100 tends to be overweight in oil. Yeah, the last, when I looked at the fund that I had in Wealth, Wealth Simple, it was very overweight in um, drug companies. Andy N says, How many index trackers do you believe is a good number to have? I guess not 12. I don't think you need more than three. Um, Possibly only two. I have a US index tracker. I have a global hedged bond tracker. So it's hedged for exchange rates to um, minimize the fluctuations in exchange rate. And then I think you could do those two and that's it. Um, you know, some people will do a, a global tracker, just one global tracker which again has about 60% US, which, you know, that, that's not, that's not a terrible play either. Um, a lot of people in the USA do a US, an international and a bond. So three, but I think a global bond and either a global equity or a US equity tracker would be fine. So you could just do two, make it simple. That way, when you want to reinvest, you don't have to worry about trying to buy five or six or eight different things. Yes, God bless John Boggle. Sadly, we lost him in 2019, but uh, he has been a huge proponent for passive investing to save investors money. Vanguard is now a massive investment company. Several trillion pounds under ownership. Tony, yeah, Tony, you said, what's the, what about the future exchange rate when investing from the UK into USA funds? So the funds are actually domiciled in, in Ireland and the UK, Tony, at least the Vanguard ones. Um, the Vanguard has a good article about interest rate fluctuations and how that affects you. Um, basically what the articles, I don't want to get too much into the technical, because I honestly read that a while ago. I don't remember what it said particularly, but it says over the period of time, the fluctuations tend to even out. So interest rate fluctuations are not too much of a concern for those US index trackers. Derek says, open a T21, a T212 account. Check out the pies. You can create your own ETF mix or whatever. I'll check it out, Derek. I don't have much of an interest in creating a pie. Um, I, I don't want to have to adjust things, and that's what I worry about having too much. You know, if I had a account that had 10 or 11 index trackers in them, I'd be adjusting it. If I only have an account that has two, I have really nothing to fix. Right? I have a global one and the US index track and I'm done. There's nothing for me to change or or to create. So that's why I sort of go for these very basic investment options. I don't want to overcomplicate things. Derek, so I hope that explains. Andy says the F FTSE 250 has done a lot better than the FTSE 100. Yeah, maybe. Paul says he has, a little, he has a little portfolio focused on hydrogen energy. 
David, what about the Vanga Life Strategy Fund? Um, again, it's I, I've experimented with that. I had my mother's funds invested in a life strategy for a while. It just didn't do as well as having it. I had, had her invest in the U.S. equity, the global track, and then one, one life strategy. And um, I think four years, it just didn't perform that well. So, um, you know, it's not a terrible option. You just have to look at the makeup of what goes in the portfolio. So, again, I, I tend not to be wanting to be invested in the UK. So, life strategy does have some UK in it, which I would imagine is why the performance wasn't as good. Craig Graham says, website called Moneyvator is great for those into index trackers. Lots of good trackers listed. Moneyvator. Interesting. Let me put that. Okay. So like a blog. Yeah. Cool. I am all for anybody that, uh, that gives a thumbs up to index trackers. Mike's is careful. Ireland isn't in the UK. That's a good point. I wonder if it's Northern Ireland. I don't remember if the Vanguard funds are domiciled in Northern Ireland or Southern Ireland. Annabelle says, you agree regarding life strategy fund. I also cash mine in. Yeah, and the thing about the life strategy, right? I mean, you can't really tell after three years performance. Um, you really, you've got to leave these things running for probably five years to know if they're any good or not. But I just felt like, um, I felt like too overweight in the UK, just not something I'm really into. So I, I made that adjustment for, for good old mumsy. David. Yeah. You know, sometimes I miss things. I miss things. I can't keep up on everything. Unfortunately, uh, Moneyvator. I should sign up for my, I'm signed up to so many blogs and newsletters. It really gets too much. So anyway, uh, let's see if there's any other news that I miss. We're going to wrap things up. We've again, run way over uh, when I was creating my research today, <laughs> I, th I said to, um, uh, I was thinking, I, I don't have enough to talk about. I always seem to run just way over. I'm, apologies. I think the stream's too long, but you know, it is what it is. Andy said he had the 80% life strategy fund and it didn't go anywhere. Yeah, Andy, how long did you have it for? That's the key. You got to you got to let them run for a while. So anyway, I think we'll wrap it up again. Hit the thumbs up button. If you can, don't forget to join the Facebook group. If you haven't already joined, here you go. There's the Facebook group. So if you're interested in Bitcoin, I recommend picking up a bit, not a lot. Don't put your life savings in. Go ahead, sign up using that link. You'll get 20, uh, 10 US dollars of Bitcoin if you buy a hundred bucks worth. Bitcoin's doing some cool stuff, some, some fluctuations. Again, Bitcoin's a 10 year plus investment, probably boom or bust. Um, yes, uh, I have the Vanguard, I'll type it in, U.S. equity fund and global fund fund. Those are the two, two funds that I have. Peter, yes, I will run a poll and we'll see. We'll see what the best time is, but yes. Anyway, thank you everybody for joining and it's great to see you be healthy. Remember, don't hoard all your money. I, I treated myself to a pressure cooker this week and I was, I didn't want to spend the money, but uh, some somebody said to me, don't hoard your money. Spend money on things that make your life easier. 
You can't take it with you. So I bought the pressure cooker. Don't hoard money. There's no point. You know, we don't know how long we're going to be around for. Enjoy. Enjoy your life. Be healthy. Stay COVID free. And uh, I will see you next week at the approximate time of probably 7.15. You'll get an email notification if you're on the list of when the stream is going live. And appreciate you. And we'll see you next week. And no, ES, my mic is not new. It's just usually out of the picture. But I put it here. So I hope the audio is better. All right, everybody, have a great night. Speak soon.